All right, good evening. This is a continued hearing for a preliminary subdivision review on the application of the United Church of Underhill for nine lot plan residential development at 422 Vermont Route 15 in Underhill. And it's referred to as Harvest Crossing. This property is in the Underhill Flats Village Center zoning district and the proposed use is a residential with open land owned in common. The initial preliminary subdivision review was held on Monday, July 1st, 2024 and was continued to Monday, August 5th, 2024, and then again on August 26, 2024. And at the 26th of August hearing, it was subsequently continued to tonight. Uh, tonight's date is September 23rd, 2024. This is the Underhill Development Review Board meeting. Uh, regularly scheduled meeting. No, it isn't. It is. Uh, this application is subject to review under the current uh, regulations, which include the 2011 Town of Underhill Unified Land Use and Development Regulations as amended through March 3rd, 2020, and the 2015 Road, Driveway, and Trail Ordinance as amended through December 18th, 2018. Purpose of preliminary subdivision review is to determine the preliminary conformance with the municipal plan and the regulations and ordinance in effect at the time of the application. Identify issues or concerns associated with the proposed subdivision. Recommend modifications necessary to achieve conformance and identify any additional information required for subdivision review prior to the preparation of final documentations. Should additional information be required, be required, the board reserves the option to continue the hearing to a date and time certain in order for that information to be submitted and reviewed by the board. So the development review board members who are present tonight include myself, I'm the chairman, Charlie Van Winkle. To my right is um, board member Penny Miller. To her right is board member Karen McKnight, Dan Lee and Matt Chappick. Um, Karen was not present at the previous hearing, although she has reviewed all the material submitted and went through the fun process of reviewing the tapes. So thank you for that, Karen. Um, none of our board members are present on the GoToMeeting platform or, or Zoom call. No, it's a GoToMeeting. Um, and then are there members in the public in attendance to comment about the application? If so, when it's your turn, we'd ask you to identify yourself, state your name, your address for the record, and your mailing address if it's different from your physical address, if you want a written copy of the decision. It would also be helpful to the, to the zoning administrator if we had your email address. Um, are there any state or municipal representatives present other than the zoning administrator and acting in their representative capacity? And I'll say no. It doesn't look like anybody online is saying nope. Okay. So uh, copies of the rules of procedure that the board follows, as well as an interested party information sheet, are available to all attendees for review on the town's website, or one can be obtained from the planning and zoning administrator. Only those interested persons who have participated either orally or through written statements in a DRB proceeding may appeal a decision rendered in that proceeding to the Environmental Division of the Vermont Superior Court. If you're an applicant, a representative of an applicant, or an interested party who wants to participate in the hearing, we ask that you clearly state your name prior to speaking. What I want to do now is swear in all those present who wish to testify tonight. Uh, all individuals in person and online who plan to testify must take the following oath by responding, I do, at the end of my statement. And that statement says, do you hereby swear that the evidence you give in the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Anybody online want to say I do? Okay. Uh, are there any conflicts of interest or have there been any ex party communications on part of any of the board members? No. Let the record say it. No conflicts of interest or uh, ex party communications has been identified. So in regard to tonight's hearing process and to allow for an efficient meeting, the board will hear from the following parties, basically the applicant or their representatives, which would be George or, or Dan, uh, the Interim Planning and Zoning Administrator, Brad Holden, 
members of the board, members of the public present, and then after we do everybody present, we'll go through folks participating remotely or online. We'll give everyone who's interested an opportunity to participate. After the applicant, after everybody in the room has uh, has participated, we'll give the applicant or his representative an opportunity to respond. Final comments will be solicited from the planning and zoning administrator as well as members of the public. And more board members will have an opportunity to ask final questions or make any final comments. All speakers should address their comments to the board and not to other parties present at the hearing. Members of the public are afforded five minutes unless requested and a majority of consent of the board to extending the time. The board may ask questions to anyone in attendance to discuss the application. At this point in time, uh, the materials that were submitted to the planning and zoning administrator, administrator since the previous August 26th hearing on this application are, are entered into the record. And they are Exhibit X, which is a letter uh, from Gerard dated 9-17-22, I'm sorry, 24. Exhibit Y, additional stormwater review, second round, McCain Consulting Engineer, dated uh, September 16th, 2024. Exhibit Z, plans and details are 2024-0913 from McCain Consulting. Exhibit AA, harvest crossing pre-development stormwater analysis dated 9-16-24 from McCain. Exhibit BB, Park Street culvert pre-development stormwater analysis dated 9-16-24. Exhibit CC, harvest crossing post-development stormwater analysis dated 9-16-24. Exhibit DD, Park Street Culvert Post Development Stormwater Analysis dated 9-16-24. Exhibit EE 100 Year Post Development Stormwater Analysis. Oh, don't pet the cat. <laughs> don't pet the cat. <laughs> Exhibit EE 100 Year Post Development Stormwater Analysis dated 9-16-24. And Exhibit FF Civil Engineering Associates Independent Review of dated 9-20-24. These exhibits, along with materials submitted for the previous preliminary subdivision review hearings on this application are available for, in the Harvest Crossing review file, DRB 2309, BT 422 at Underhill Planning and Zoning Office or by request on the town's website. All right, that's a lot of preamble I got through. So right now, <laughs> George will begin first by hearing a summary of information submitted to us. Uh, and for us and the folks in the room and those participating remotely, please press your talk button on your microphone. Thank you. Uh, I tried to share, but let's see if I can try again. Share my screen. Uh, entire screen. Oh, there was, there was an extra step. Yep, no, I can zoom in and. Okay. Yep. I tried to do that. <clears throat> okay. So, yes, kind of a summary of what has changed since the last DRB hearing. Um, so taking into account some of the comments that we had from the DRB, we've reconfigured the lots and shifted the development to the east. So that's further to the top of the screen here. Um, the previous houses that are on the, the west side of the road uh, have moved anywhere between 45 and 75 feet to the east. Um, the goal with doing that was to get the houses at a slightly higher elevation. So right now they're shown at 706, where previously they were 705. And it also leaves this area down to the west of the proposed houses as a more open space to allow for that uh, runoff storage when and if the uh, swale that runs along Harvest Run overtops and backs up into the meadow. So this was kind of the problem area that was shown in some of those photos when, when it does back up. So we've shifted the houses away from that area to protect them as well as provide for the stormwater runoff storage down below. Um, other than that, not much has changed with the plan set. Uh, with some of the property lines have changed. 
and we relocated the duplex that was previously down on lot three up to lot seven, where there's a little more space there for it given the new configuration. Uh, and we provided a little bit of the emergency turnaround and some of the other infrastructure to match with these relocated house sites. Um, but we're achieving, you know, the all this town road standards as far as a 30 degree corner radius, uh, 15 by 38 turnarounds with a maximum of 30 degree radius over here. Uh, and all the other associated changes that went along with relocating those houses. Uh, nothing much has changed. We're still going to have two separate wastewater systems and um, each unit will have its own individual tankage and lines and a water main that runs through with individual connections. It's just that their location has been shifted uh, to move that road to the east as well. Um, George's Penny. I think you also uh, raised the grade between the units uh, before I think it dipped down between the units more. So you raised that area, it looked like, which was, uh, I think, a positive thing, a good thing to do. Yes, yeah, the, the grading did change throughout there. So we are bringing 705 basically from, uh, that's this contour right here that runs down around and through the rest of the houses. So this, you know, the road way here will be at 705 with some, you know, the houses at 706, so slightly uphill to each house site from the shared road. But it's still the same kind of drainage pattern we did. Previously, we had one long stormwater swale running above the development on the uh, east side. So we've still got the same culverts here. We're just rerouting the stormwater differently so that we um, can shift those houses further to the east and go through there. As far as the other exhibits, it's a whole lot of multi-page stormwater hydrocad reports, um, which I won't get into a super amount of detail in here. Um, but there was some concern about the water level in the meadow and some of the pictures that were submitted during the last hearing. So I went out and did a site visit. Let me change which sheet number I'm looking at here. So we went out, I think it was exhibit I, um, I can't recall the exact number, but it was a picture taken from the meadow in uh, roughly this location here near the very corner of the property and the iron pin. Um, so I went out and did a site visit. We found the location where that picture was taken. Uh, if you look across the street, you can see the brown house and driveway for the Ritchie ID property. Um, so we went and I found that we got elevations. Uh, we got the elevation of the low point in that swale where the overtopping was observed and that was at 702.7 feet. Uh, so we used that to update the stormwater modeling to basically, um, we pretended that there was like a weir outlet and this acted more of as a pond than a swale. So it would allow for water to flow into the meadow here. Um, and use that to update the stormwater analysis using, uh, I believe we did one run that was just for the development we're looking at here so that it was just showing that we met the 10 year and 25 year storm events for the new impervious surface we're creating. And then we also ran a, a stormwater analysis using the downstream uh, Park Street and post office culverts that were some known pinch points there that are causing this backup and water to overflow into the meadow uh, and did an analysis that confirmed that those culverts cannot handle the 100 year storm event. Um, but we've got a, a elevation, a flood elevation in the field of approximately 702.68 um, during that 100 year storm, uh, which is consistent with the fact that the swale overtops at 702.7. So basically the water in the level is water in the meadow is matching the level of where it overtops the swale at the point that was shown in that photo. Again, Penny, you're not being heard. Sorry. Uh, it's Penny. Could you for me, as long as you're talking about that, 
trace the contour that that water then would back up to the 72.6 with your pointer? Like where would that water then come in that 100 year storm? Yep, as in the existing condition or after we've added the houses and regraded? Or I can show you both because I think on my next sheet here there, I have both those sets of contours. So that would be, uh, I mean, seven, for calling it 702.7, .7, if we wanted to round to 703, that's this dashed line here. So it's going to be slightly below this line that runs through and behind these houses in the existing condition and then up the hill somewhat. And then this way. So in the post condition, it will run along this lowest solid line contour here, would be that same water elevation, um, which then will also allow for passage to and from in this culvert that we're specking here. And then out. Well, yeah, the water will flow this way, but if it's backing up with flood storage, it will allow it to mimic the existing condition and also flow that way. So I think, yeah, we've, we did uh, a bunch of the other analysis looking at the 10 year and 25 year storm event. Uh, we showed that both at on the site as well as at the Park Street and uh, post office culverts, we won't be increasing the flow rate there. So um, that is meeting the state stormwater standard manual as well as the 25 year storm for the town of Underhill regulations as far as runoff rates are concerned. And we won't be increasing the velocity or the volume of the water that's going through those culverts at any given time. And I believe that addresses most of the revised attachments. So we took your report and we sent it to our consultant, mm -hmm. Civil Engineering Associates. Uh, did you get a look at their rebuttal? I did. did. They commented on your Yes, the they give you accolades for your designs. <laughs> so it was uh, yeah, not an easy modeling something. process. Yeah, <laughs> I understand that. Um, do you have any comments on their um, their yeah. review? Uh, sure, I can go through those item by item here if we want to talk about their main areas of concern through here. Yeah, that that would be yeah. great. Yeah. So the first one was about the proposed elevation access of the driveway between the fire department. Uh, and Route 15 and concerns that the road would act as a uh, dam or a berm, um, reducing the weight at, rate at which floodwaters can recede. Then um, they advised to consider whether a floodplain specialist should be consulted to review that aspect of the project. Um, that The floodplain specialist would be up to you guys. Um, I believe I've shown that we've got the culverts going through that will provide that flood water to recede. What we're talking about here isn't very fast moving water. It's just allowing migration from one end to the other. So I don't believe that this road will create any issues with the ability of the, or it won't cause the road to act as a dam. It will still allow water to migrate back and forth between either side of the road. Um, Could but, you help me out here? At, at least on a drawing I have, I don't see the diameters of those culverts. I believe they're 12 inch. 12 inch. Yep. Okay. So you think that's big enough because you're you're yeah, not really right. channeling any water there. It's just in the event of a backup, right? Correct. Yeah. It's not it's not a speed or a flow rate issue. It's just a, it's allowing it to ebb and flow back and forth. It's never going to be traveling very fast. We've seen it there. It just kind of sits still. Yeah. So I think mostly it's not really going anywhere. It's waiting to infiltrate into the ground. So we're just allowing it to travel back and forth between the two. And then you've got a, a long one that goes from between the duplex and uh, and lot six. Oh, a long culvert. I'm sorry. I, yes, I yeah, said we a got, long we one. Three there. long ones on 
in between all the sets of houses. You do. Okay. Yeah. And those are all 12 inch as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Again, we, that's about the largest diameter of a round culvert we could do in order to have adequate cover material over the top of the pipe. And given that the grade is so flat, um, we could look at some kind of squash culvert or arch opening that would allow for a larger surface area. But I did look at the uh, runoff rate coming from the meadow lane side of the project and the 12 inch culvert was more than enough to pass those flows. It was about a third of the way full during the 25 year storm. George, it's Penny. I, I think you've just answered my question. I was a little confused about what the civil engineering associate said because I thought the issue was, or maybe it's just one of the issue was, one of the issues was that water was coming from Meadow Lane toward the project and dissipates on that property so that it was indicating that by building up the road, the water would, would be dammed up and would then back up to properties on Meadow Lane. I thought that was what he was saying, so I didn't really understand what he meant by floodwaters receding, but he was talking about water coming from the harvest uh, run and coming in and then receding back to harvest I think it's a run. combination of the two. During the smaller storms, um, I don't think there's very much water migrating from Meadow Lane because it's of about the same elevation as what we're doing here. But if we have a, if, if there is any runoff that is making its way to the low point in the meadow, um, the culvert will go through there. But I think his floodwater receding is the alternate direction. It's if the meadow fills up and crosses over the property line to allow it to move back into the low point of the meadow. So it's providing both functions, the culverts under the driveway. So Karen, um, a question. Um, so the culverts, the long culverts between the um, houses on the east and the west, basically, where is the water coming from and where is it going to channel it? So it's a very small drainage area with where the water is coming from. It's the area uphill of the houses on the east. Uh, up until about here when you eat, reach the top of the bank for that swale that runs along the top of the or the east side of the property. So we just didn't want to have issues of water in this. It's not very much, but if it did get a decent storm, water brushing up against foundations or running over the top of the road and creating a washout. So it's just allowing it to drain in the same direction it currently is, which is down the slope from in between the swale and the low point in the meadow. But the, so that the, you pull your, you're going to pull your mic down just a little bit, Karen. Sorry. Okay. Just to make sure you're so the um, amount of water coming into that area is coming from the meadow lane direction or the hillside? For the long culverts, it's coming yes. from the hillside. The hillside. Oh my God. For the shorter culverts under the road, it's coming. Well, if it will allow the meadow lane runoff to come if it does, which I don't believe is very much. Um, but whatever is making its way over there, it will allow it to continue to do so. Thanks, <laughs> One more thing, Penny. Um, educate me on stormwater a little bit. This is what I think I understand, that water, stormwater can infiltrate or stormwater can flow. And if it's winter, which we're finding more in climate change and the ground is frozen and it rains, no stormwater is infiltrating. Would that be correct to say that? And instead it just flows from spot to spot until, until I don't know what, it gets to the Browns River or it one day infiltrates? Is... Yes, I, that's, yeah, I, I don't know that it restricts infiltration completely, but it certainly reduces it to have frozen ground. Um, again, in, in areas where you have lawn and other area that isn't traveled on regularly, we don't get a significant frost penetration as you do, say, under a road or in a path, walkway path that you are walking the dogs along. Um, but yes, I think it can either infiltrate or have surface runoff. And in that winter thaw condition, it's going to be more surface runoff than infiltration. And so any stormwater modeling 
really assumes infiltration can happen in any stormwater modeling in life. It doesn't assume a frozen ground, right? Correct, yes. It, it assumes, it takes into account the soil types that are based on uh, the ability of it to infiltrate. So different soils have different infiltration rates and different surface covers have different infiltration properties. But it, I'm not aware of any models that take into account frozen ground. So a lot of these soils that you've modeled are hydrologic soil group D. Yes, right? which is the which least infiltrative. Isn't very infiltrative anyway. Okay. It's not like you know you got sand. Sand's like the most. Clay's like the least. Mm -hmm. So you know the D is closer to a sand to a clay okay. substrate. Yeah, if I forget the exact ratios. I think it's two thirds of that type D soil that's the least infiltrative to start. I have a question on the about the leach fields uh, in the 10, 25, 100 year storms. Are those uh, leach fields still operable? They're still safe? And yes, they will be. That, that's a okay. it's a different flow path. Those the soils there, um, we're digging down to get to a, a very nice gravelly layer below to allow it to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. um, so some occasional ponding on the top is not an issue as long as we have watertight. Um, fixtures like distribution boxes and whatnot um, to make sure that flood water is not getting into the system. Okay. Okay. So the second bullet in the CEA um, analysis, just allow me to read it for a second because I've read them all, but I've got them all mixed up in my head. So they talked about we are removing the swale that's on the west side of the houses um, that was shown on the previous plan. We had a pretreatment swale. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that is true, but we haven't changed the grades at all here. So it's just, it's a much wider ditch that is sloping the same grade. So we didn't specifically call out a ditch on the plans because with the proposed revisions to the stormwater treatment structure, we no longer need the pretreatment swale that we had originally designed. Um, but it is still effectively acting as a swale going uh, across there and routing everything to the stormwater detention structure. Uh, they are correct that <clears throat> we would want to keep a close eye on it post-construction um, because if any, if there's any settling in that area, um, we'd want to make sure that there's no ponding or other nuisance issues occurring that would prevent stormwater from draining to the proposed treatment structure. Um, but most of what we're adding there is fill versus cut. So I, you know, the the primary, the uh, most of the area <clears throat> that's going to be conveying the stormwater here is natural grade. We're adding a little bit of fill on this side and cutting a little bit over here, but we'll tr trying to avoid compaction and whatnot in this area to allow it to continue draining out toward the meadow as it currently does. Yes. To ask you a question on that. Yep. So I buy the house. I want to put up a backyard pool and it's above ground. No, let's say above ground pool. Can I still put it in there in my backyard if I'm on lot one, two, or three? And I'm assuming the water will flow around the pool if it's above ground. If it's an in ground, it'll go into the pool. <laughs> right. Then it's another stormwater. Right, it's another problem. Right. <laughs> If it's a, if but, it's a but, solution. you know, could I, in your opinion, could I put a backyard pool up there? Um, well, we've got, we're showing the building envelopes cutting off about here so that we can preserve this area for the um, for stormwater? stormwater treatment and, or stormwater storage and conveyance. Yeah. So I would say we'd probably in the final plat, we'd want to identify an area where no structures like that could be. Um, okay. Placed, you could probably do a swing set or something that doesn't detain the storage. Yeah, volume. yeah, but um, but um, you know, I, anything bigger than an eight by eight shed or something, I would say we try to limit that. In in that area, but if the building envelope, you mean within the building envelope or beyond the building envelope, you're talking about right now. We we typically see. only allow it within a building envelope, a shed, say for okay. instance. So then would the pool be considered a structure like a shed? Usually, mm -hmm. I can't recall the undergrad regs. Most towns have a, no, it's less than 100 square feet yeah. or something. Yeah. It doesn't count as a structure. Yeah. It was just a kind of hypothetical question. That's gotcha. a good question. 
yeah, right now we have that building envelope cut off at about the 704 contour um, to make sure that any significant structure is staying away from this stormwater storage area. Uh, so then we've got the 702 elevation contour along the southern boundary of, Na of lot nine. They're asking if there's a gap in the data between the 701.8 and 702.2 points. Uh, let me change my sheet here. Oh, it looks like that data may have fallen off. Oh, here we go. So they're talking about this area here between 701.8 and 702.2. Um, I think that may have been more relevant to the original stormwater design where we um, had not proposed a detention structure and we're using the wetland meadow as the storage area of receiving water. So in this case, even if water is flowing through the meadow and off the property, we have shown that the runoff rates during the 10 year and 25 year storm are less than the pre-existing condition. Um, so it will match whatever the existing flows are out here, whether they remain in the meadow or traverse through the 701.8 and 702.2 shot data that we have here. Their next bullet is that the location location of erosion control number seven, the construction entrance is not shown on sheet SW2. Uh, that is correct. That was fell off the plan as we were rebuilding the road here. So that construction entrance will be at the entrance with Route 15. Um, and we can update the plan accordingly before we submit for the state construction general permit uh, to manage stormwater runoff during construction. Uh, the grass channel pretreatment swale erosion control number eight is still shown on sheet SW3, but has been removed. So that is correct. We're no longer proposing the pretreatment swale on the east side of these houses. So we can remove that detail from the details sheet to avoid any confusion there. Uh, we're showing an infiltration basin detail on sheet SW3, but our modeling did not account for exfiltration or infiltration within this treatment structure. Uh, and that is because we're, the exact design of this, whether it's just a detention pond or a infiltration basin uh, will depend on uh, some soil test pits to determine that we can actually infiltrate soils in here and that it will support infiltration. Uh, we modeled it in the worst case scenario, which assumed no infiltration. Uh, and just, this was a solid, pure detention pond that will just withhold the water and release it at a slower rate. So if we are able to support infiltration within this structure here, that would only lessen the flows that are seen downstream. So we modeled a, a worst case scenario and just had both details on sheet SW3 to show what the options are, whether that structure is a infiltration basin or a detention pond. George Penny, um, and you said if it is a detention pond, it will release the water. Which direction does it release the water? Does it go uh, to the end? south and to the wetland meadow? Okay. Our receiving waters are these, is this class three wetland sea right here? Uh, and then their last comment or bullet item here was regarding the level spreader detail, having some verbiage and verbiage added to uh, make sure that the uh, level spreader itself is anchored correctly and protected from frost as well to match the detail in the state stormwater manual. So we can certainly add that verbiage to the stormwater detail uh, for the level spreader if it's required. And then the last item is up to you guys. It just talks again about the uh, whether or not it would be prudent to have a flood water or a flood specialist look at this from a flooding perspective. Um, it is outside the 100 year flooding zone. And so I'm not sure what analysis they might run. It is beyond my area of expertise. So I don't know if the, uh, you know, flood specialist could pretend this is in a floodplain and model it differently than I have with my stormwater runoff uh, modeling. But you've be... modeled it and you've concluded that this 
the hundred year flood elevation, the water's gonna come up to the seven oh two six eight contour. Seven oh two point six eight correct contour. So I basically what I did was I, I took um due to the limitations of what I my software and what I can do, I, I think I've done a reasonable job modeling here, but we basically pretended that the 703 and 704 contours, we modeled this entire existing condition as a pond yeah. uh, with an outlet that, or an inlet up here at 702.7 just to see, and we assumed there was no outlet to see how, how high the water would raise. Um, and it was, you know, the pond, quote unquote, filled up to 702.68. Yeah. But yeah, the software I used was a stormwater modeling, which is different than a, you know, heck RAS or floodplain modeling stuff. So. All right. Um, I think that covers the attachments, unless I missed one, Brad, or? Uh, the berm, maybe on the left side. The berm. Oh, that's it. Did I miss something within one of the bullets? Okay, yeah, in the second bullet, later on in the paragraph, stormwater runoff may flow seeking the path of least resistance in the southerly direction to this underhill garage property. Um, so we've shown a berm here at 704 feet that will uh, run along the adjoining property with underhill garage. Uh, obviously, that's not the land that we own, so we didn't get out and do any topographic mapping there. The uh, state LIDAR elevations suggest that this property is at the low point is 703, which is consistent with the elevation within the meadow. And from my recollection of a visual observation, I think it was about the same elevation. Um, so their question was just whether that berm should be maybe higher than 704 to make sure there's no stormwater runoff, short circuiting the pond um, and running off into the underhill garage property. I think with my with what we've shown as far as the elevations are concerned, I, I think 704 is a reasonable height for that berm. Um, but they had thought that was worth potentially looking into. I have a question about the um, topo around the storm basin. Um, is the top is there is it like a berm going up and then back down so um or is it even grade then it just drops off into the storm basin I'm trying to figure out what happens in a in the storm um does that fill up just from the surrounding water or does it have to circuit around and come in or yep no I've had the so we've got this this contour right here where we oh. So I'm trying looking at the screen, which is lagging behind. So this is one of the proposed contours that we'll have to collect all well, the drainage coming from this way. So it'll be, um, you know, there is a little bit of berming on this side of the pond to make sure that water is not infiltrating back in from the meadow. Um, and then there's a little bit of cut on this side to make sure that we're getting positive drainage from behind the development down into the pond. Um, and then this will be a depression about a foot and a half um, that will allow for water to collect in there, slowly release through the outlet. Um, and then you know, once it gets below the level of the outlet to the pond to slowly infiltrate, um, just like the wetland meadow itself drains now after about 24 hours when we do get those flooding events. So the top, the very top of the berm around the uh, stormwater is at 702 or yes so in a hundred year that would just top out over Correct. the top yes, of it's that it's not designed for the hundred year flood but for the 10 year and 25 it allows for the passage through okay all right i uh, i think this is all great thanks so much for revising the plan and doing the modeling on that no problem I, I think it, it Turned out pretty slick. So, uh, yeah, on the the um, stormwater detention basin, just want to 
I think I encouraged a lot last time for moving towards infiltration and yep, yeah, which wanna, will be want to do the same again. Um, I mentioned the harvest market where or the the market over there that uh, they have one of these detention ponds and it all silted in around the same time as our last meeting. They were putting in what looked like a septic system in the front field, and I think that's because their stormwater permit failed and they had to spend money to put that new system in and uh, it would be unfortunate if a development for low-income housing had to go through the same process after five or ten years of service so I, and I, I know you're gonna dig test pits and if you can do it you're gonna do it so just putting a plug in to you know make it happen um, that would certainly be the best case scenario and I also, uh, I don't know if you could look at um, maybe replacing those long culverts with infiltration chambers under the road. Um, but I think that might be, there might be a solution there that involves something other than, I don't know how long those are, but looks like about 75 feet of 12 inch culverts, which seem potentially problematic in a neighborhood setting. Okay, we could can, we can look into that. I think the, in this case, I, I generally agree with you. These ones are, you know, the length is primarily due to the grade. And since we're bringing those houses up, the where those culverts are gonna be located, they shouldn't be seeing much in the way of any sediment runoff or clogging issues because it's just receiving runoff from the meadow that's up above the houses. So it's, yeah. it, uh, hopefully there's not going to be much, you know, sedimentation or clogging issues with those, even given their run. Yeah, sorry, um, I meant more like, you know, cats getting up there, or oh, okay. dogs, yeah. or <laughs> goats climbing up there, you know, God a little in the kid climbing up there. Um, it, yeah, and I, I, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, the septic systems are no problem because you've got good soils down there. Yeah. And, so you have you have the option of you know skimming a foot off of an area that's going to get filled um, and then have you know a durable surface over it and I think that's the perfect location for uh, stormwater chambers and something that hasn't isn't done very often but um, it cer certainly seems like a, an opportunity to use some uh, cutting edge technology for this this sort of uh, issue. This is Penny. Could I ask one of you to explain both of those items? So Dan, what's the, you were saying infiltration versus detention you were hoping for? What, what do you mean and what does that mean? What's the implication here? Well, I'm, I'm not the expert, but there's like um, um, there's like half dome things that you can bury in the ground that you can direct stormwater to, and they fill up and then they infiltrate through the bottom because the bottom's open. Yeah, yeah I haven't the seen them often used under roadways, but they're pretty common under large parking areas, like at a car dealership. So it's like a it's an arch that you excavate down well below where, where the parking surface is going to be, uh, fill that with a level bed of stone, and then you put these arch chambers that are all piped together underneath to allow for storage under the parking lot instead of building a pond, say, next door when you have limited space. So I don't know if there would be enough room under the roadway to support the storage that would be needed to do the all the stormwater treatment, um, but it's something we could look into. And, and that's with regards to the culverts that you two were just talking about, or that's with regards to... That would be an to alternative that? to the culverts, so we wouldn't have to pipe under the road. We could infiltrate on the uphill side or underneath the road instead okay. of passing underneath them. Okay. And then, before that, Dan was talking about a pond, about the detention versus infiltration. You, you brought up two points, didn't you? So the one before that had to do with what? Um, but, well, you probably would answer this better than I would, but the, so we're, 
they have to get a state stormwater permit. The state is going to require the holder of the permit to have the site inspected to make sure the stormwater infrastructure is is operating as it should. And if um, if it fails in 10 years or in 15 or 25 years, then the person who holds that or the entity that holds that permit will be required to modify the infrastructure to, you know, that they have in place um, to make the, you know, to appease the permit. So because of that, you were suggesting a certain design versus a different design. I just didn't understand that. Yeah. Um, infiltration, which is they've talked about um, really trying to do infiltration if they can. Um, but if the soils don't support it, then it's not possible. I have a sneaking suspicion that there's just a bed of gravel under this field. but maybe a foot or two of, of the clay, not very permeable soil. Yeah, yeah we, we didn't investigate in the area where the pond is going to go, but where we have the leach fields, it was um, two or three feet of a less acceptable, less permeable um, kind of loamy layer. And then it was nice riverbed gravel down below that. So it just depends on how low that gravel layer is over here, if it exists. Um, if we've got to go down five feet to get to it, it's not really feasible to do an infiltration basin that's five feet below the surface of the ground. Okay. Um, but if it's two feet down, then that matches kind of the elevation we're proposing already. So we could tap into that for our infiltration basin. So I guess next we'll hear from you, Brad. Sure. Yeah. Um, you can stay there, George. If you... <clears throat> I'll just expand on that berm situation against the Underhill Garage. I think we all know it's a really thick canopy there along the along the boundary between Underhill Garage and and the church's parcel. And I think what uh, CA was alluding to is that the lidar might not have penetrated it properly. And there may be a spot in there, you know, there might be a little dip or a spot where it could escape and get into that low area. So there, you know, that might become another problem area if water was introduced along this boundary and it had a place to escape. So I think all he was asking is um, to get permission from Randy Clark to just check some elevations along that tree line to see to make sure there's no little sneaky low spot there where water might be able to escape um yeah going back to penny's concern about the the ground being frozen i think in the events that i've seen um, um that happen in the in the winter um you know, typically, like George said, if the if the ground's not being walked on or compacted, it's it's pretty much free of frost. I don't know if that's the situation in this field, but the water does dissipate after a day or two. It disappears, so it's going somewhere. And if the ground was that frozen, it wouldn't be disappearing. Um, I can't attest to how long the water stays there, but. I can just say if the water's not, if the ground's not being traveled on, there'd be no frost. Like if you go on your lawn all winter long and you haven't been walking on that spot, you can dig a hole right in the ground. And your frost doesn't, doesn't travel where it's, unless it's exposed and the wind's hitting it, you know, that may be a different situation. But um, that's what I think George was getting to with the, the, um, the field and the ground, frozen ground. Certainly the frost will be several feet thick where you drive and walk, you know, and the dog path around the outside that will be frozen hard. But any area that's not, any area that's not walked on, um, and if it has some kind of snow cover on it, is pretty protected. 
Um, so I, I, you know, I talked with CA and about the concerns about the water flowing back and forth and the flood concerns. And, you know, so the metal lane folks, you know, it's two different situations. We've got the metal lane when the roaring brook crosses banks and then infiltrates that, which is, it's going to flood them anyway, whether this development's here or not. The question is, is will this development, this road, like keep the water maybe in their, in their vicinity longer or be able to not okay. escape? And then we've got the issue with the ditch and the inability of the drainage along Park Street to carry the water out fast enough. Um, so we did, we did apply, the town did apply for a hazard, all hazard mitigation, um, grant to potentially upsize that culvert along Park Street. So, which may add some relief and certainly the culvert underneath the, um, the harvest lane and access to the post office needs to be addressed as well. It's undersized. Um, and then if the ditch was cleaned out properly, and we had a bigger size culvert going from 36 inch to 42 is actually like a 36% increase in volume. Um, so those are things we're looking into, um, just so people know. Um, I did want to introduce a couple pieces of evidence tonight. Um, and I have some... Um, copies I'll pass out and for you in the audience I made some extra copies as well if you want to pass that down how many we got five yeah you have to share yeah you can pass those out I just want to keep one yeah to share one. yeah Here. so are we going there So in, in 2011, so let me explain this map before people start jumping to conclusions. Um, um, in 2011, uh, we did a study on the Browns River. So there was a, a flood study. Whoops, what's going on here? Okay, yeah, I'm just going to get everyone back on the screen. Um, so in 2011, um, FEMA did a study on the Browns River and they hired a company um, called CDM Smith and uh, the town actually hired me in 2011 to review some of these flood maps and the and the gross errors that that came along with the the mapping um, we made a lot of comments we got some uh, some areas some areas they showed floodplain where it shouldn't have been. Some places they had floodplain where, or no floodplain where it should have been. Um, but regardless, I, I spoke with uh, Kyle um, Madash, I think is his name. He's the floodplain coordinator for our district. And we, we looked at this. And um, so the area in orange that you're seeing, well, first of all, this is what's called a draft map. And I've never seen a draft map before, but the process usually goes that we receive a preliminary set of maps. So we get a preliminary set of maps. We have the opportunity to comment, review those maps. The contractor takes our feedback. And in the case of 2011, they made, you know, a bunch of modifications. Um, and uh, then basically you get a final set of maps and there's a review period and then they become what's called effective. So these are far from effective. This process will probably be two or three, maybe four years out, but these are a draft set of maps we received back in April. And as you'll see, the, the orange is a 500 year floodplain. So we don't regulate, the state does not regulate or we do not regulate 500 year floodplains. Um, but you'll notice that, you know, it, it, it consumes the entire area that we're talking about. And it also goes across Park Street and it's put 
the Jericho market in the 500 year flood zone. And then it extends to the north up near the triangle where Park Street and Route 15 come together. I, I just, I look at this and it's like a flashback to 2011 where I think that's probably grossly an error um, unless they know something that we don't. But I just wanted to admit that. So um, it's something that the town did receive. Um, and we'll see when it comes to the, uh, the preliminary map stage if this changes or not. And then, so, so Brad, before we move on. Yeah. You said the orange is a 500 year flood. Correct. The legend here says it's zone X. That's right. And it says it's 0.2% annual chance or 1% drainage area less than one square mile. That's what zone, that's what a 500 year floodplain is. It's okay. a 0.02% chance of flooding. Yeah. And, and the town does not regulate to 500 year or nor does the state of Vermont. Yeah. It's kind of a, so currently now with the effective firms we have now, 2011 firms, this area is not in a floodplain at all. Not a zone X or it's, it's, it's uh, no flood zone. So um, in talking with the FEMA, our district coordinator, he pointed me to a study that the state has done with the University of Vermont. And um, they basically have studied, um, so the benefit today versus 2011 is we have statewide LIDAR. So we have accurate contour data, um, much more accurate than we had before. Um, back in 2011, the Browns River was flown with LIDAR, so that was brought up to date. But the rest of the town didn't have the benefit of the contour data. So now that we have statewide LIDAR data, more accurate contour data than we've ever had before, UVM has done... Um, what's called a relative inundation for conservation and restoration planning of the Lake Champlain Basin. So in there, um, they ran some different modeling um, than what FEMA does. And these are not regulatory maps at all, but um, they're put together by some pretty, a pretty bright group of people. And um, there's eight modeling storm sizes. So they've, They've done data sets on the 2, the 5, the 10, 25, 50, 100, 200, and 5-year peak flood, um, peak floods. So I've prepared a little document or a package here that talks about um, the program and how they came up with their modeling. And I've got two maps here that show, um, that show the area we're talking about. Um, they do not have this area in the 500-year flood. I think we'll rely, we probably will rely heavily on these maps when it comes to the comment period for um, the FEMA maps. I um, also gave you a hillshade map, which I think is really handy, but I want to just hand those out and you're welcome to I'll give George a copy. Yeah, I don't have this one. Thanks, Brian. But the state is really relying on this for flood resiliency. Um, and it's an excellent program, and I'm anxious to learn more about it. So I'd like to, I guess, um, enter uh, the draft FEMA map as Exhibit GG. And the uh, UVM uh, State of Vermont Lake Basin Program Inundation Study as uh, HH. And as far as CEA's recommendation, you know, flood modeling is tricky business. Um, there's a lot to it. Like George said, he, he has his um, models where he runs stormwater data. But floodplains experts run what's called hex res modeling, taking into account the Roaring Brook drainage area. Um, they would they would 
study the uh, the outflow on Park Street, and they would run modeling. So I will say back in 2013, I was I can't remember if it was 13 or 11. I think it was 13 where we got the May storm. Uh, I believe it was 13 that caused the flooding on Meadow Lane. So that was that was caused from the Roaring Brook jumping its banks, just oozing in this one little spot, just um, just east of 12 Dumas Road, the FEMA buyout that is progressing um, as we speak. But there's one little spot there where it's just a subtle, subtle split swale. And if the Roaring Brook gets top of bank, it just starts to leak out that one spot. And it's amazing how much water came through there. Um, the last time it happened, so during an event like that, we're allowed, the town is allowed, and we will be purchasing the property at 12 Dumas Road. The papers have been signed. We're in the process. I don't want to say it's a done deal, but we are moving forward with the buyout of 12 Dumas. The benefit of that will allow us to have access to the Roaring Brook. So when flood danger is imminent and it's coming, you can do emergency protective measures, Sandbag. sandbags, whatever it takes. Um, when there's imminent flood danger, you're allowed to do whatever. However, you cannot berm the riverbank. You know, that's just not allowed to do. But I think the ability of having um, 12 Dumas Road in our, in our possession and clear access to it will benefit Metal Lane and this project if we have an event like that again. Um, the event, I think, involved the breaking of some beaver dams as it did on Silly Hill. There were abnormal events um, that just brought a lot more water down than any 100-year event would ever do. Um, Brad, it's Penny. Could I ask you? That, that spot that uh, the Roaring Brook decided to ooze into, was that in the Dumas, 12 Dumas yes. uh, area? That's in our, that'll be the property if, if the buyout is successful okay. that we will acquire. Okay. So um, anyway, for what it is, um, this is some information that I've gathered. Um, I'm gonna follow up with Ned Swanberg, who's more um, up to date with where the Lamoille Basin uh, FEMA mapping is at. And I want to talk with him about some of the maps that he's seen, some of the draft maps, get his comments. Um, but again, 2011 was, if, if I would have shown you some of the, and I'm not discounting that this could possibly be in a 500 year flood zone, but, some, but I can tell you that if you just look at, at where it is down at the, at the old mill property, um, it should it should give you pause or um, to say, wow, is that is that really right? Um, so in 2011, we had areas up on Beartown Road here, and you're all familiar with Acer Ridge and and Sucrusoros property. So they had mapped the Millbrook um, up to 50 or 60 feet up Acer Ridge. So they said that the Millbrook would flood up into Acer Ridge. So they obviously didn't have um, the contour data they, they should have. They, they did actually have it because when they flew the Browns River, um, it was a one-mile corridor. So they had accurate data up there. They just didn't use it. So this is a subcontractor. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of history on this. And it's the same subcontractor that FEMA is using again. Um, so, um, I guess that's all I have to say about flood, but I, as I say, uh, uh, George isn't a floodplain expert. I'm not either. I can interpret, you know, I've done a lot of FEMA work and I can interpret contours and, and flood lines and just basically give the basic feedback of, um, where water should be and where it couldn't be. So. Thank you. Is that all you got? Um, I we'll, think that's all I have. We'll now open up the hearing to those members of the public present who wish to provide input to us. We'd ask that you come here, 
sit at the table. George, you can stay there. I'll just ask that you spin your mic around and uh, we'll bring up a chair. Bring up a chair. Yeah. First one there, bring up a chair. And then after we go through folks here present at the hearing, we'll go through folks online. Is there any members of the public who wish to participate? Dan. Thanks. I'm I'm Dan Manns from uh, United Church of Underhill. So um, George George did a bunch of revisions on this, you know, at your at your request, and uh, he um, had to like break this down into dumb guy speak for me so that I could actually understand what he was uh, what what he had done and what he was saying. But I think I think I got this clear now in my head that. You know, the concerns about water accumulating on lower metal lane, well, we don't do anything with this project. That water still accumulates there before it gets high enough to run into this lot that we're talking about. So the trick is, I think, for lower metal lane to make sure that we don't create that dam that those folks are worrying about that would retain that water there longer um, than than it it's currently going to be there. But it's currently going to be there even if you don't do this project. It's currently going to be there because that area is just a shade lower than where it begins to flow into this property. The second part I understand better now is so the water coming off the hill down by Harvest Run, the so that water flows on to this property. And because the whole area is pretty flat, as it rises up, you see that water starts to move back towards Meadow Lane, <laughs> you know? And so in that case, the folks on Meadow Lane might actually like to have the road there to create the dam to keep any water from moving back on. But I think, I think the reality is probably in a worst case scenario, the water goes back and forth. You know, and that's what it's done forever and ever, and that's what it would continue to do. I think George one more time reinforced to me that you know we build houses, put the road in. There's less ground to infiltrate the water. Um, the stormwater features that he's created more than adequately handle that water. So the water that is going to get created, presuming this construction. Um, I think the stormwater feature seems perfectly adequate to handle that, as as I understand it. So I think those were some of the some of the big concerns. I wanted to um, add to kind of a real world implication of this thing for us. So you may or may not be aware. The church's plan is we bought this property. We're going through this subdivision process. Um, with you when we get around to actually building the houses back up the church intends to do the infrastructure put the roads in you know subdivide the lots get the uh, get the wastewater treatment areas ready when when we go to actually build the houses the church is going to transfer these lots to green mountain habitat for humanity and that's the group that would actually do the construction. And we like that because they build quality homes. These things are um, really well designed. They told me that their average house can be um, heated and cooled for about $400 a year. A year? I said, are you kidding me? You know, like, let me tell you what it costs to do my place, you know? And so um, I think these are really well-built, attractive homes that we hope will be in character with uh, the rest of the neighborhood. Green Mountain Habitat for Humanity is trying to figure out, are they going to be able to get going on this in 2025, or are they going to have to push this off to their 2026 planning year? So just a real-world implication you know, this process is going on a little longer than we had originally anticipated. We're perfectly happy to have you guys give this the most rigorous scrutiny you can, 
that's great. We want to be absolutely transparent and everything here. But um, the quicker we could move along to a decision on this, um, it's going to make it easier for them, Green Mountain Habitat, to plan what their next year or two of construction looks like. So just for your consideration. Thanks. Anybody else from the public present wish to participate? No? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll open it up to the folks online. We have two people participating. Robin Pierce is one and Bob. So either Robin or Bob, do you want have any comments regarding the development? Chat function works too. Okay. Uh, according to the script, uh, yeah, George, if you have any final comments, it's your opportunity. Um, I I don't think I do have any. I, I hope that we've addressed all your concerns and provided the information you were looking for to. To make a decision, but I can't think of any additional items to add unless you had any last minute questions. I'm going to elbow you. I, I do. Of course you do. <laughs> Press the button. Okay, George, um, a couple of questions and then I need you to explain something to me. Okay. So it looks to me like there is no room really for garages on this uh, on these lots and I ha am only familiar with one Habitat for Humanity home I believe in our community and it does not have a garage so the intention isn't I believe to build them with garages um, but it does seem to preclude garages I would say because of the building envelope the size of the building envelope and the size of the lots uh, potentially, I mean, there are some creative ways to, if you did say a one bay garage with living space up above, um, okay. yeah, we've, it's been, you know, it's a modest house size based on the feedback we got from Habitat for Humanity for what they would actually reasonably construct out here. Um, and I do not believe it was intended for Habitat to do any garages. If an end user wanted to come along and try to squeeze a carport or a one bay garage somehow within that envelope. Um, so the houses to the east for instance that is a septic tank off the house and probably a carport could not go there correct okay and there yeah there's no those are for conceptual purposes there are some yeah. requirements on where those septic tank goes with regard to um, 10 feet from the property line 10 feet from the structure ah. five feet from the driveway um, but you could hypothetically put it on either side of the house if that house shifted within the building envelope or okay. You know, the ones on the west side could be beside the house instead of behind it as okay. long as it was meeting all those requirements for setbacks. Okay, so that's that's not our problem, but maybe the designer of the, or maybe it will be your problem eventually. To I think, think it will be my ahead. problem down the road. Yeah, yeah. thinking so ahead to that. Making okay. sure they're putting that in a spot that makes the most sense to be flexible based on what the footprints come up with as versus this conceptual plan. And speaking of carports, <clears throat> Some meetings earlier, we ta I asked the question that obviously, at the very least, people will be buying or building sheds and possibly even carports. And so impervious service will be added to this project. But you felt at that time that you had, that was, that was sort of calculated in, that there's a fudge factor in uh, the stormwater calculations so that they could handle something like that. Correct. Yeah, we had okay. a, a factor of safety into those impervious service right. numbers. Um, the way that the state looks at it is you get up to 5,000 square feet. Um, that's kind of your factor of safety level and anything above that, then it would require a stormwater amendment. So we need to go back in. If there was a, you know, if everybody put up a 1,000 square foot Accessory dwelling, Accessory dwelling or whatever, or garage. Like we have to go back and, and revamp the stormwater design. Okay. Um, but we have uh, 
accounted for a small factor of safety for things like sheds or um, gazebos or what have you. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, dog houses. Okay, and I think that this was basically covered, but and Dan Dan summarized it well, but I think I need to hear it from you, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot about this because it has to do with a homeowner from uh, Meadow Lane, their letter to us with photographs, and I really didn't exactly understand from reading this, where the flow of water was was, and what the issue is exactly, but I, I and I don't know if this has to do with again frozen ground on Metal Lane and rain in the winter. But th but there is this uh, letter, this Exhibit X, that talks about this issue coming from the north onto the property. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the issue coming from the east and building up from the south and sort of backing up onto the property. But I just wondered if you might help me through that coming from the north, just so I feel comfortable that. Sure, I, I, I remember reading that letter, but I'd could, have to. I could, I could I, hand it. I just pulled it open you, on the, from the town website okay. here. So. Okay. If you give me 30 seconds to find oh, that sure. spot in the, or do you have a specific paragraph or sentence? No, there? it's really the whole letter. I just would okay. like. So, sorry, sorry to ask you. Just take a few minutes to look at it, if you wouldn't mind. It may be more toward the bottom of the first page. It's talking about flooding from the Roaring Brook, but I, I don't know that that's That was 2013. All. I don't yeah, know yeah, that he that's... talks about the end of the 1990s and 2000s from the Roaring Brook, um, which again, that that water is inundating those homes before it reaches this property. So right. I'm confident that our project will not have any adverse impact due to the Roaring Brook overtopping its banks. And then on page two, he's talking about um, the flooding event in December 2022. Okay. Yeah, I see that here, Alan Morris. And I gather it's frozen ground and rain. And it may have to do with the water, where the water needs to flow to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that talks about the um, overflow from the ditch along harvest run and backing up behind the fire station. So that's kind of the, the backwater event that we had modeled at that 702.7 .7 elevation. Okay. Showing that when that ditch overtops, it works its way toward Meadow Lane. And we've shifted those houses further to the east to make sure that we're minimizing the impact to that stormwater runoff area or stormwater storage area, as well as providing the interconnected culverts to make sure water that has historically been able to flow back and forth is able to. Okay. So um, it was the Roaring Brook flooding, and we've talked about how that doesn't happen often, and maybe with the Dumas property, we'll, we'll have some area to mitigate that. Um, and the issue of it, it creating a dam at the roadway that goes into this property, you're, you feel like it really won't with those, with those culverts or with whatever Dan is proposing going across to allow water to go back and forth and not create a dam. Correct. So that water backs up more into their, into their basements. You know, that, that what shouldn't yeah, happen. Yeah, we should be able to we're, the, flow. As we have it designed now, we'll allow for water to move back and forth to match what is historically happening. So whether, you know, if the roaring bank does overtop and it affects those properties that would eventually make it to their meadow, it will allow water to flow in the same from way. north to south. Okay. And if the ditch overtops at the south end of this property into the meadow and starts to build up, it will allow water to flow from south to north. Okay. And it sounds to me like even, I know that the ditch a long harvest run is a is a bit of a snag and i i personally don't like the idea that it requires the good will and money and conscience of homeowners living uphill to clean it and maintain it at the appropriate times otherwise they'll get fined because i'm on a road association myself on my road and the last thing we do is put any money into the road. We, we, nobody wants to spend the money on the ditches of the road. Nobody has the money. And if they have the money, they have to spend it on something else. So I, I appreciate if, you are, if this all works 
with areas for water to go without having to rely on somebody at the top of Jacobs Hill putting money on and cleaning that ditch uh, proactively. That would make me very happy. I just want to say that. It, it would work better if that ditch was better maintained, but yes. I think we have a good fail safe for in its existing condition. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your patience on all of no this. No worries. And thank you for your patience on all of this. That's only two questions. Was it? I think I maybe I put three and two together or something uh, like okay. that. Number three and two. I think I'm done. All right. I would just like to clarify that we're, we wouldn't be mitigating anything with the 12 Dumas Road buyout. It would give us accessibility in an emergency situation. So there's no mitigation that can happen there on the riverbank, just to be clear. Well, maybe I'm using the wrong word, but in an right. emergency situation, the issue could be somewhat That would be tempered. emergency protective measures. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Not mitigation. Okay. Mitigation would imply that it's a fix, a longer term fix. I see. Okay. If sandbags are put up there, they need to have be Have to removed. be taken down. Right. Uh, I was wondering if we just could quickly look at uh, a couple of those pictures. What? On Exhibit X or? Which? Yeah. Um, the one that, from, uh, uh, the one that the one yes, yeah, and just if you could, if we look at that and you could yep. give an idea of just where the <clears throat> homes are. So let me share my screen here so I can make sure. Or, or where the fill is in that picture. So are you, I've got them up on the screen here, if you can make sure I'm looking at the right picture. Just the one with the dog in the side. I can blow it up too once I There's two with the dog in it and there's a stake in the, there's a stake right there where you're. Yeah. Yes. That's perfectly right. I have to and then the other, uh, picture too, just to get an idea of where the houses are now relative to that. Okay, let's see if I can recall what that stake is. Let me look at my where plans. Where is our back? Our back is toward Meadow Lane, so it's okay. uh, the fire station would be to the right, okay. and we're looking out towards the Harvest Market field. I think if you took that tree line, if you took the dog and looked at the tree line, you know, you can use that as a reference. Yep. The dog's almost standing on the tree line. So, so, the, so the bill maybe comes a little bit out into that uh, pond area. So I think that stake was a stake I put in for a test pit so my survey crew could locate it, which is down here in between the road and where the proposed leach field is going to go. That makes sense. So it's this kind of half-filled circle okay. SB6 area, which on the plan that shows the cuts and fill is right here. So that would be um, the 703 and 703 cross here. So that would be roughly no change in elevation where that stake is in the ground. Um, and then we'd be cutting in a little bit for the swale behind it and above it here for the culvert. And then the fill would all be to the left side of that stake as you're looking at it um, out in this area at the edge of where that water level currently sits. Okay. So, so those meadows it, it would be... doesn't extend into that area that much? Uh, not significantly, no. I, I, again, I don't know tough scaling on a photo, but I don't yeah. believe it should get in there very much. No, I think we're mostly right along the edge of it, and this area where it's low-lying is what we're trying to preserve by shifting <coughs> those houses to the east. Is number five there the one? Number five, that one. That shows the water line a little bit higher, I think. It's, can you see the stake in that one? Or it's, no, he's walked past it. He's walked the past line. it, yeah. Yep. It's more into the class three now. Yeah. 
And maybe where the infiltration basin is? Or... Uh, yeah, let's see if we can. But that's a good shot of seeing the tree line. This is what I was talking about with the um, uh, with the dense canopy there. Yeah, yeah it's you know, those cedar. thick cedars, hard to penetrate. And the old railroad bed is right there. You could probably almost see what the existing contour is right there. Then you'd know what the water level was. Yep. So that gets around. That's so yeah, it's in the about that same level we were looking at seven oh two and change, going around through here and filling up this area. And the basin uh, would actually take up some of that water, right? Yep. Yeah, it would probably be in, in this vicinity right through here because um, we've got it just before the low point um, so that we can catch all that water on its way to the lowest point in the meadow. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions from the board? Any other questions or comments from the public? Stop sharing, we'll go back to that. I can do that. Does the board feel we have enough information at this time to make a decision on the application? You're shaking your head up and down, Penny. I'm surprised. Now at some point I have to call it quits. Okay. No, I'm good. I'm happy about that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask for two motions. One to close the evidentiary portion of the hearing and then a second motion to uh, approve or deny the application in open session or, or closed. So I'll entertain a motion to close the evidentiary portion of the hearing. Better turn your mic on. Let's have I'll everybody turn their mics on. Just everybody, please. I'll make a motion to close the evidentiary portion of the hearing. All right. So, a motion by Karen. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of closing the evidentiary portion of the hearing signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. And then I'm going to ask the board if you wish to vote to approve the or deny the application open session or closed session or deliberative session. So I need a motion to move next. I make a motion that we uh, move. I make a motion that we um, go into a deliberative session to decide and talk further on the project. OK. Is there a second on that motion? Matt made the motion to go into a deliberative session. Uh, it's Penny. I'll second it. Penny seconds it. Any discussion? All those in favor of going into a deliberative session, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. So what happens next is we're not going to take any more evidence. We, don't, we can't come back to you for anything. We're going to talk about the application in what's called deliberative session. Uh, within 45 days of tonight, we'll give you a decision. Hopefully, it won't take that long. Um, there's a 30-day appeal period after that decision is issued, and then you can submit um, for the next step in the process. Um, we have to go through the appeal period before we can receive the new application. So uh, everybody's here. will get a copy. If you signed in, you'll get a copy of our decision via mail, and we'll go from there. So certified mail. So uh, if there's no other comments or questions, we'll close this portion of the meeting. Thank you for your participation.